We're now very fortunate to have Muzammal Ayyub Thakur, who will be speaking to us about Kashmir. As you know, this is part of our theme this first in night. We'll be having talks so we understand the plight of Muslims, our Muslim brothers and sisters, across the globe in different countries. Muzammal will be speaking to us about Kashmir. He's the director of the Justice Foundation, Kashmir Institute of International Affairs, and president of the World Kashmir Freedom Movement, WKFM. His father was exiled in the 1970s from Indian-occupied Kashmir with the penalty of death if he returned, and the only person in the history of India to be conv- convicted of treason. He was born in exile in Saudi Arabia and moved to London shortly after. Completing education from London universities and pursuing a career in finance and economics, he's drafted reports and policies for think tanks, the United Nations, foreign governments, in addition to addressing and attending many prestigious international events and conferences, including seminars and the UK, EU and Turkish Parliament, Capitol Hill, US Senate and the United Human Rights Council. He's appeared on numerous international television channels and has lectured extensively focusing on Kashmir, Pakistan and India. He's been regularly invited to international events to talk about the case of Kashmir, such as at the UN, the Organization of Islamic Countries, international universities, and foreign governments. So let's start with Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa Ramadan Mubarak. I'd like to thank SICM for giving me the opportunity to share with you the ongoing crisis in Kashmir. But I also want to mention that one of my first public speaking events was with SICM over a decade ago. So Mafil Ali is very dear to me. I don't want to get into a history lesson, but instead, I want to spend some time talking about the root causes and consequences of occupation, subjugation and oppression of the people of Kashmir at the hands of a brutal imperialist who have expanded their vision to mainland India, where there's now an open assault on Muslims and other minorities. Now, when we talk about India's illegal occupation of Kashmir, we have to understand that this doesn't vary from one political party to another. There's general consensus in India that Kashmir is their integral part. Some might question the human rights violations and others will try to pursue confidence building measures. But ultimately, they all agree that the people of Kashmir and the territory belong to India, despite the UN resolution stating clearly that Kashmir must be given the right to self-determination to decide its own future. And in the words of India's first prime minister, not to be uh, into a forced marriage with the people of India and the people of Kashmir. Now, I don't differentiate between political parties in India. And when it comes to Kashmir, as an outsider, I would offer the opinion that minorities, which basically means anyone who isn't an upper caste Hindu, probably feels the same way. Various parties are open and transparent in their agenda, while the rest are wolves in sheep's clothing. In context of Kashmir, I'll give you the most recent example of the BJP, the ruling party, revoking Article 370 and 35A, bifurcating Jammu and Kashmir, turning it from a de facto occupation to a de jure occupation, breaking international laws and UN resolutions along the way. Article 370 and 35A basically protected the territory of Kashmir until a UN mandated referendum would be held, giving Kashmir, so essentially Article 370 gave Kashmir a semi-autonomous status, considering it's still a disputed territory. The Indian opposition, the Congress party, jumped on the bandwagon once Article 370 and 35A were abrogated, and they emphasized that the BJP were only able to unilaterally absorb Kashmir into the Union uh, of India because the Congress party had spent years slowly diluting Kashmir themselves. They were fighting to take credit for an illegal and undemocratic action. And when they're not fighting for credit, they certainly don't condemn actions that would benefit the Indian political agenda of either party. Take the example of Amnesty International. When a huge international NGO is told to pack up and leave and never return, essentially being banned, then what kind of India are we looking at? The blame may lay with the BJP, but where was the outcry from the other political parties and their supporters? Now, although rhetoric still sells in India, and many still fall for false promises and propaganda, there is an increasing realization from a generation that's more educated, with more exposure and more connected, that whatever has happened and is happening is not normal. And because of that comprehension, the institutional policies on Kashmir have begun to be questioned, from basic human rights to the question of India's so-called sovereignty over Kashmir, but only after facing the beginnings of open assaults on themselves. Case in point, the CAA and NRC bills, which is the Citizen Amendment Ship Act and the uh, National Register of Citizens bill. A textbook tactic of fascists like Adolf Hitler, who did exactly the same thing 85 years ago. But here's the thing. Although the fascism of Nazi Germany may have been defeated in 1945, Hindutva fascism was founded in 1925 and today has flourished. 
A cursory glance at the links between the fascism of Hitler and Mussolini with the RSS is blatant and undeniable, but we'll come back to that. The CAA and NRC bills passed last year affect poor Muslims more than anyone, as it's the poor who are overwhelmingly without paperwork to prove that their grandparents are, citizen, uh, are citizens. Everyone else except Muslims can use the loophole of non-Muslim refugees from Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh and so on. And Muslims would be shunted into detention camps or even exile. And when talking about the CAA and NRC bills which affect Indians, I would go so far as to say that the root cause of the discriminatory bills is the revocation of Article 370 and 35A of Kashmir. Let me explain. The CAA and NRC bills are discriminatory and exclusionist for both Muslims and minorities in India, but I have to emphasize that this is irrelevant to Kashmiris. And as a Kashmiri, I can state with authority that we don't identify, nor are we, by any stretch of the imagination, Indians. However, Kashmir has always been India's laboratory where they've experimented with various versions of oppression and subjugation while continuing their illegal occupation. It's never mattered which political party was in power. The Indian state as a whole have always maintained a singular policy on Kashmir. But there's more to India's policy. Using Kashmir as a testing ground for more than 70 years, the Indian government finally exported its trials to mainland India in the shape of the CAA and NRC. And although the CAA uh, bill was passed in 2019, the principle itself predates the birth of India. And those principles manifested in Kashmir over seven decades on an extreme scale, leading to war crimes, crimes against humanity, ethnic cleansing, genocide, and demographic change. And now we've all witnessed the farmers' protests against land reforms that discriminate them as well. Recently, a report was published that India have already issued more than 3 million domicile certificates to non-Kashmiris so they may permanently reside in Kashmir. The demographic change, ethnic cleansing and settler colonial project is in full swing. So much so that it took Israel 50 years to do what India have done in less than a few months. Which brings me to the current BJP government, headed by Narendra Modi, backed by the RSS, a parent organization of the BJP. Both radical, neo-colonial, right-wing, fascist groups that have an imperial expansionist program and aspire to create a pan-Hindu nation under one party as they believe they are a superior race and want to impose cultural nationalism. If that sounds familiar, that's because it is. Not just familiar, but identical to the ideals of Nazi Germany. Identical to the extent that the RSS's literature is inspired by Hitler and Nazism and even pays homage to them. The RSS uniform is inspired by them. The RSS salute is inspired by them. And the RSS vision too is inspired by them. One party, one culture, one nation. Their expansionist vision called Akhan Bharat goes as far as the Middle East, to the extent they, uh, they claim the Holy Kaaba in Mecca as their temple, referring to it as Makeshwar Mahadev Temple. What can you expect from people, uh, such people who call the Taj Mahal as Tejo Mahalaya Temple, Qutub Minar as Vishnu Stam Temple, and of course the controversial and now demolished Babri Masjid as Ram Janam Bhumi Temple, also known as the Ram Mandir. On a quick side note, I want to mention that the foundation laying of Ram Mandir happened on the 5th of August 2020, exactly a year after India illegally annexed occupied Jammu and Kashmir. The symbolism is apparent, and that was purposefully done. There is no coincidence. First, they abolished the Kashmiri identity, and then they laid the foundations of the Hindu identity over the ashes of the Indian Muslim identity by destroying the masjid. And it's not just the identity of those they consider lesser mortals that they want to diminish, but eliminate anyone that does not bow down to them, submit or convert. We've seen numerous mob lynchings all over India, uh, which has become very apparent with Western media as well as local media in India. The threats of digging up dead Muslim women and raping them, concentration camps in Assam, and of course cold-blooded murder is very common now. And under the BJP, the Indian judiciary has finally been given the freedom to be used as a tool to impose, institutionalize, and legalize the BJP's reign of terror, Hindutva terror. I remember the case of Tabriz Alam in India, where the 11 accused had tied him up, beat him mercilessly, and filmed it while forcing him to, uh, to chant Jai Shri Ram and Jai Hanuman. He was married for six weeks before he was attacked and died of his injuries. Another Indian Muslim called Afrazul was hacked to death chopped to pieces by Shambhu Lal Regar while live streaming it all. What's worse is that he was later bailed by the BJP to campaign for their re-election. Although these are examples of Muslims, other minorities face persecution and brutalities as well, even though they aren't Hindu. They just happen to be a lower caste, which for some reason renders them as obscene as Muslims. 
Which leads me to the fact that there are terrorist training camps running all over India. And not just for adults, they train them young. They instill this sick ideology and mentality in them early, which can only be described as brainwashing because I can't believe that the human race, even Hindus, are born with such thoughts. Yet in Kashmir, we've seen extreme forms of terror that can't even be described as human rights violations. And whatever has happened in Kashmir is not ancient history. It's all, hap it's all happened in our lifetimes and continues to happen right now. But what's worse is that no one in Kashmir has known anything less than occupation, subjugation, oppression, hundreds of thousands dead, destruction of property and businesses in the billions, tens of thousands raped, innumerable enforced disappearances, thousands of mass and unmarked graves, human shields, torture, bullets, pellets, orphans, widows, half-widows, cyber cells, media blackouts, illegal draconian laws, false flag operations, war crimes, crimes against humanity, ethnic cleansing, genocide, demographic change, settler colonialism, fake and staged encounters. The list is endless. Kashmir has been used as a testing ground by India for decades, and that laboratory experiment has now expanded as a policy into mainland India, which has led to an implosion as we've all witnessed caused by the CAA, NRC, and Farmers Build more recently. This is where Kashmiri's frustrations comes to boil. Because we've been warning Indian minorities for years, and they watched what happened to Kashmiris, yet they remained silent. Now, the arguments that minorities in India had to be careful for their survival is a weak argument, if not a false argument. Because the people of Kashmir for more than 70 years stood firm in the face of oppression, subjugation, and occupation, despite the crushing force of the Indian army, the draconian measures of successive governments, and little to no international coverage. India have time and again broken international law, and in fact, Genocide Watch issued an alert on Kashmir on the 15th of August 2019. Bear in mind that in October-November 1947, nearly a quarter of a million Kashmiris were massacred, and tens of thousands forced to migrate, as reported by a London newspaper. I mention this because last year, Genocide Watch issued another alert saying that preparation for genocide is definitely underway in India. Now, what can you expect from a nation whose army chief laments that protesters in Kashmir use stones instead of guns as it would be uh, easier to justify killing children? Or if the army major who screams on an Indian news channel to continue using rape as a weapon of war in Kashmir? Or of political leaders directing their supporters to dig up the graves of Muslim women and rape them? Or of a terror accused being supported and winning a parliamentary seat? And how this translates to ground realities in Kashmir, to give you an idea, I'll only go as far back as 2000, uh, August 5th, 2019, when India illegally absorbed Kashmir into the Indian Dominion. Now, hours before the clock struck midnight on the 5th of August 2019, the Kashmiri diaspora, like myself, were flooded with goodbye messages from friends and relatives who sent something ominous was about to happen, uh, uh, courtesy of the Indian government. And then more than 14 weeks of silence, Kashmir was cut off from the world. But more importantly, people like me were cut off from our loved ones. The world knew what India had done, yet those India had actually done it to had no idea due to the blanket ban on media and communications. While the world talks of 5G, space exploration, self-driving cars, advancements and innovations, India yet again threw Kashmir back into the Stone Ages and we faced the longest media blackout and internet shutdown in history. As we sit here, we still don't know the full extent of what's happened in the last 18 months in Indian-occupied Kashmir. With the additional military forces sent to Kashmir, the total number of armed forces and military personnel now stands close to 1 million, further making Kashmir the densest military to civilian ratio in the world. It's also worth noting that India sent thousands of buses full of Indian migrants to Kashmir, as well as armed forces in civilian clothing, including intelligence operatives. Public assembly was, pro was prohibited, forcing nearly 10 million people to be under self-imposed house arrest or else risk being killed. Last year, with limited information coming out, some reports said that more than 30,000 Kashmiris were preemptively arrested, with many transferred to jails outside Kashmir because the cells were overflowing with detainees. In fact, The Telegraph on the 25th of September 2019 reported that 13,000 minors were also subjected to abductions, and there's even evidence of children being kidnapped in the middle of the night and women molested. All pro-freedom politicians were and are still detained, including many religious heads and community leaders. Media banned, mobile communication banned, and then downgraded from 4G to 2G. Most landlines banned, schools shut, businesses closed, causing more than, uh, causing more than $5 billion loss to economy. 
All industries suffered severe blows, pushing the majority into loan defaults or even closure with hundreds of thousands losing their livelihoods. Food, water, medicine were running out. Free movement restricted to the extent a young woman gave birth to a stillborn child because she was prevented from reaching the hospital. Funeral processions banned. Death certificates banned. There were reports of people burying their loved ones in the back garden. The injured, mostly by pellets, but including bullets, were arrested if they went to the hospital, if they even got to the hospital, as healthcare was severely restricted by curfew and military roadblocks. Schools and universities shut down, gravely impairing education and added to the trauma of children and parents. The local and regional media lost whatever little independence they had, forcing them to become mouthpieces of the government or entirely to close up shop. Kashmiris living abroad found out months later of family events. One young man learned that his fiancée died 16 weeks after it happened. A son who had not seen nor spoken to his mother in months watched a news channel where he saw a glimpse of a pass by a reporter that was reporting the story. Then there were the digital deaths, where WhatsApp numbers were suddenly deactivated because of inactivity and leaving friends and family fearful that maybe it rep represented something more insidious. And that was just the first few months after India illegally and unilaterally annexed occupied Kashmir. But over the last seven decades, there has been a sustained campaign to demonize Kashmiris and convince the Indian public of the threat that we pose, allegedly. India's own media has extensively written about the mass radicalization that India doesn't even acknowledge. The case in point would be eight-year-old Kashmiri Asifa, who was kidnapped, raped, and gang-raped in 2018 by eight Hindu extremists and then killed. Mass protests followed, demanding the release of the criminals, if you can believe, who were eventually granted bail. This is the same country that awarded medals to those who use Kashmiris as human shields and staged two fake encounters in Pulwama and Srinagar in the last few months, alleged that they were terrorists, only to be proven as lies days later. The same country then refused to give back bodies for burial, a right that is respected even in war, but not for Kashmiris. In fact, a few weeks ago, seven people, including uh, Mushtaq Wani, the father of one of the murdered boys, Atar, was charged under the draconian UAPA law for demanding their son's body back for his last rites. India's justification for their crimes is security issues in Kashmir. 18-month-old Hiba Nisar was a security threat, so they shot her with pellets and blinded her while she sat in her mother's lap. 14-year-old Insha Mushtaq was a security threat so, because she wanted to be a doctor to help people, so they permanently blinded her too. Three-year-old Ayad was a security threat, so they killed his grandfather in front of him, giving the poor boy permanent psychological trauma. The unborn baby of Tamanna was a security threat, so they gang-raped her when she was nine months pregnant. Three days later, she gave birth to a son with a broken arm. Two entire villages of women aged between the ages of eight and 80 were security threats, so they were raped and gang-raped in front of their entire families and neighbours. The truth is a security threat, so they lock up journalists and charge them, such as Ghazi Shibli, um, Fahad Shah, Masrat Zahra, Pirzada, Ashik, Gauhar Gilani, and many more. Online, online news portals are constantly under cyber attacks, and their editors routinely harassed, arrested, and charged under draconian laws. Asif Sultan is one such example. He spent the last two and a half years in jail and has a daughter that's three years old. She was six months old when she last knew her father, and she barely recognizes him now. Free speech is a security threat. So they killed my friend Babar Qadri six months ago in his home in front of his family. And freedom is a security threat. So they bring draconian laws like the PSA, AFSPA, and UAPA to make sure that rape, human shields, murder, enforced disappearances, and torture are justified. And just a quick explanation, the PSA is called the Public Safety Act, which means that anybody can be imprisoned for at least two years without trial. And in Kashmir, we call them revolving doors because then you can have another PSA uh, lodged against you and then you go into jail again. The armed for the AFSPA is the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, which essentially gives impunity to the Indian armed forces, meaning that they are exempt from prosecution and punishment for crimes like murder or rape. Coming to a close. I ask you to think of the torture centers where unimaginable forms of cruelty are meted out, like electrocution on private parts, sodomy, pliers used to pull nails, rollers used for flattening roads used on legs, salt and chili poured into wounds, detainees held in cells with hungry rats uh, forced to consume their own urine, and worse. 
Think of the abductees who were tortured in mosques with the loudspeaker turned on to instill fear and terror in the population. And that was in my hometown where my family have suffered. Think of the family of five-year-old Samir Rah, who was grabbed by the army, a stick shoved down his throat so hard that they broke his teeth, front as well as back. They played football with his head before stamping on his throat, killing him instantly. Think of five-year-old Nasir, who was picked up by the Indian occupational forces. His eye was punctured with a needle and sand poured into it. Think of Kalandar, who had his legs amputated and was force-fed his own flesh. Think of Parvina Ahangar. Her son was a victim of enforced disappearance 30 years ago, and she's still looking for him. And remember, the world community condemned and intervened in atrocities committed by the Nazis, the genocide in Rwanda, the ethnic cleansing in Srebrenica, war crimes in Chechnya, crimes against humanity in Uganda, the settler colonial and demographic change in Palestine, the plight of the Uyghurs, and Indian-occupied Kashmir had, has witnessed it all, experienced it all, suffered through it all. Yet the pressure and reaction that should exist doesn't, despite India's blatant and brazen disregard for the UN resolutions, the Geneva Conventions, humanitarian and international law. But hope never dies nor will the sentiment for freedom. We'll continue to battle against the shackles of tyranny and look forward to, uh, to support, uh, look forward to our friends and allies for their continued support and advocacy. We look towards you for your support, inshallah. Jazakallah khair, Ramadan Mubarak, and an uh, early Eid Mubarak as well. Wassalamu alaikum.